yeah, thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. Um, before I kind of get into the meat of the presentation, I just wanted to like start with this photo, just to kind of show that um, not everything in the Gaza Strip is all horrors. There's a lot of really beautiful life and humanity that uh, doesn't ever really get talked about. So this is one of my favorite photos I took. Um, and this is uh, right in front of um, the Fun Times Cafe, which was bombed last summer um, while people were watching the World Cup and killed several people. And there's just a huge crater where the cafe was. And this is right in front of it. And so I, I was swimming at sundown one evening, and this fisherman with his little boy came, and I happened to get this photo. So just thought I would share that. Um, so uh, just so we understand what we're talking about, basic definitions. I'm going to be talking about Israel-Palestine. This land here is historic Palestine. This is the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the lighter area is modern-day Israel. Um, a little bit more about myself. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I left, I went to Palestine a little more than a year ago to start reporting and uh, didn't actually know anyone there and just kind of like made it happen and over the summer found myself in Gaza. I was able to get in um, rather unexpectedly. But uh, when I first moved to the West, to Palestine, I was living in a refugee camp in the West Bank uh, in the city of Bethlehem called Ida Camp. And um, I spent two and a half months living there and I would kind of see the daily violence of living under occupation and um, if any of you have been to Ida Camp, you'll recognize these scenes. So this is a military base, a massive military base, where the Israeli military launches attacks on Bethlehem, on Ida Camp, and the vicinity on a daily basis. Inside this, mili inside this military base is uh, Rachel's tomb. Rachel is a biblical figure, as well as a yeshiva. So, Essentially, the military is using these religious sites as human shields, um, which you know Palestinians are frequently accused of, yet there's no actual evidence to prove that. Um, but here we see the, the daily violence, where we have a soldier drinking coffee, having a laugh, aiming his weapon, and then we see what he's aiming at, children. This is what I would see on a daily basis. And this day, I didn't happen to see these children get shot, but typically, it would be rubber-coated bullets. And it's not rubber bullets, it's rubber-coated bullets. It's a metal bullet with a thin layer of rubber. But another day, as I came around the corner in the morning, about a minute from where I lived, I saw this little boy get shot. And the, and the sniper didn't even bother to come down from his tower. He just shot this kid in the knee. And so the kid laid on the, on the ground and cried, and his friends helped him to school. And he allowed me to take these photos. And so this is what daily life is like, living uh, under occupation. Um, I just added this photo. I mean, so this I took actually just a couple days before I left in early January. Um, this is in the village of Hosea, which uh, was largely destroyed. This was 55 homes around here that these two little boys lived in. And when I met this little boy, Safe, on the left, he was playing in the rubble. He was playing war, uh, war planes and tanks, because that's all he knows. And now he lives in a shipping container across the street. He and his friend, they're standing on their friend's house, the rubble of his friend's house, who, uh, who's out of the frame. Um, but I mean, I. My central thesis, what I think of the Gaza Strip, is it's really the most misunderstood and demonized place in the world. And it's an intentional campaign of incitement against what is an open-air prison for more than 50% children. And this is, it's not by accident that when so many of us in the US and in the West think of Gaza, we think of terror, we think of attacks, and it's a, campaign of, it's a campaign led by Benjamin Netanyahu, led by the Israeli Prime Minister and organizations associated with the, with the Israeli government who claim 
that Hamas is ISIS. And recently, Netanyahu even went out to claim that the, labor, the Israeli Labor Party is ISIS. So it's anyway to incite, to incite violence, to legitimize violence against, against people in an open-air prison. Um, the Anti-Defamation League, which is essentially an anti-Palestinian hate group dressed up as a Jewish civil rights group, claimed that the Gaza Strip and West Bank are the world epicenter, the world's epicenter of anti-Semitism. Yet, of course, the survey that they used was deeply flawed and, and uh, doesn't account for the, the, the fact that Zionism, the political ideology, the only acceptable political ideology in Israel, uses Judaism, the religion I was raised with, as a human shield. And so, when these soldiers come into the camps with the Jewish symbol on their shoulder, what can we expect but to encourage anti-Semitism? Um, so here is a more clear map of the Gaza Strip. Um, it's extremely small, 138 square miles. The widest, uh, it's, it's three miles wide at the northern end and eight miles wide towards the Egyptian border down here. Two, its uh, north and east border are controlled by Israel as well as its Mediterranean coast. Uh, which the Israeli Navy, the, Mi the Middle East's most well-armed Navy, patrols. Um, and firemen, uh, I'm sorry, fishermen who venture out into these waters are shot at on a regular basis, are imprisoned. Um, I, I went out on a fishing boat with these fishermen. I've spoken to fishermen from around the area who have told me horror stories of being uh, forced at gunpoint to strip naked, put their ID in their mouth, and doggy paddle and swim to the Israeli military boat where maybe they'll be imprisoned, maybe they'll be beaten, pushed overboard. I've heard all of, all of these accounts. Um, the naval blockade is, is at a point, goes out to a point basically where the good fishing is. So somehow in order to protect Jews around the world, Israel has to stop Palestinians from being able to eat decent fish. The logic escapes me. Um, there are 1.8 million Palestinians living inside the Gaza Strip. Um, and the crucial, the crucial fact in understanding this, which if we watch mainstream media is completely omitted, is that 80% of these Palestinians are refugees, were expelled from their homes to create the state of Israel, to create this artificial Jewish demographic majority so I can have an extra state because my life is so difficult here. Um, to understand a little more about size, I placed it over the Bay Area. You can see, very small. Um, a little bit of history of the Gaza Strip. So after 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from what became Israel, many of them fled to the Gaza Strip, which was under the protection of the Egyptian military at the time. Um, and, and in 1950, an intelligence report on the Gaza Strip noted that the, uh, the refugees in Gaza were condemned to utter extinction. Um, another another uh, incident a few years later when um, the UN was responsible for basically administering the border with the Israelis and the Egyptians, uh, there was uh, a Canadian general who wanted to surround the Gaza Strip with barbed wire, but his Egyptian counterpart refused the idea based, because he said it would make Gaza look like a concentration camp. So now, the Gaza Strip is surrounded by a series of walls, fences, uh, sniper towers, pillboxes, with and many of which have remote control machine guns fixed to the top. I can't help but wonder what that Egyptian diplomat would say now. 
Um, this is a remote control machine gun operated from eight kilometers away by an all-female team. We really see the idea of Zionist feminism. Um, on, the, uh, on the following frame, you can see, I just zoomed in, you can see the size of this gun because there's a bird. So you can see it's a massive cannon. And I've seen, actually, the last day that I was in Gaza, I saw this, um, I don't know if we have any more room. We have a few more people. Uh, okay. Cool. If, you, if you guys want this chair, you're welcome to it. I can stand. Um, there's a seat back here, too. Someone can take. Yeah, there's one seat back there, also. I can, I can give up my chair. Take that. Um, yeah, this is a massive cannon, and I've seen this thing fire. I saw this thing fire on a couple of Palestinians walking through uh, the, the buffer zone, what is a declared buffer zone inside Gaza, where Israeli snipers or remote control machine guns will open fire. And this typically affects farmers uh, because this this the zone includes farmland. So the farmers, I've, I've met a lot of these, some of these farmers, they tend to be, you know, these are not like wealthy people. These are poor, illiterate people who have been doing this for generations and this is really all they know. So it's not like they can just go to Gaza City or something and get a different job. It's literally, it's all they have is farming and they get shot at. Um, the economic situation is absolutely devastated. 55% unemployment. This, this is Mohammed Mahoun, 23 years old, who, uh, because of the siege on Gaza, which has been in existence since 2007, uh, where Israel controls basically everything that goes in and out of the Gaza Strip, he's been reduced to sifting through dirt in order to collect rocks for a living, which he sells to construction companies who are not allowed to have materials for building, for construction. He makes maximum couple of dollars a day. So I think of this as a prison sentence. If Gaza is a prin prison, this is his sentence. Same with this young man. Um, Saber, I, was, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. I was He's 18 years old, he collects scrap metal, which he's been doing since he was eight years old. So we can see there's no future. People want to stay in their land, but they're torn between trying to find a better life abroad and wanting to stay home as an act of resistance. But even if they wanted to leave, they're not allowed. So that's the reality. Um, so, how did we, the question is, how did we get from last summer, from this, this is Gaza City looking north, to this? This is Shijaiya, which underwent massive, massive bombing campaign. Um, and this, basically this green area, the first green area you see is the buffer zone. This is the farming land where Palestinians will be shot if they go out there, arbitrarily. You, you, ne you never have any idea if he'll be shot or not. I've wandered out there and it, it's just like, you just don't know. I mean, they're probably not gonna shoot me because I'm an international, the sniper can see you know, my white skin. But um, that's, and then just over here is Nahalaz, the military base in Israeli town. I mean, I can't help but wonder what Israelis who live in Nahalaz think when they see this destroyed area that used to have lights, that used to be vibrant, and now it's just rubble. Um, so how did we get here? Well, first, we talked about Operation, what's called Operation Protective Edge. And uh, that's what it was, it was called in English, to the west, to the west. Um, in Hebrew, it was called Tukitan which means steep cliff, mighty cliff. 
And so this is, there's, there's a, a defensive connotation to all of the operations that, that we're told uh, for English speakers, but for Hebrew speakers, it has uh, like a more religious, biblical context. Um, and I mean, frankly, the idea of a steep cliff or a mighty cliff is much more apt for what happened during those 51 days last summer. Um, 2,139, at least 2,139 Palestinians were killed, including 530 children, and 11,000 were injured, 70% of which were civilians. On the Israeli side, 66 soldiers died and five civilians. Um, 22 schools, on the Palestinian side, in Gaza, 22 schools, 360 factories, 24 medical facilities, in, including a Wafa hospital, Gaza's only rehabilitation hospital, were destroyed. So now all of these 11,000 people who need to go to this rehabilitation hospital have no way to do that. Um, 278 mosques were attacked, were bombed. And so later, when we saw the attack on the Harnof Synagogue in Jerusalem, the world was very upset, and understandably so. But no one seemed to remember that Israel had just bombed 278 mosques, indicating that places of worship are fair targets. Gaza's only power plant was bombed. And now, the Gaza Strip from when I last uh, asked my friends a couple weeks ago, they're down to four hours of electricity a day. The, the power plant was repaired, but Israel only allows a tiny amount of fuel in. Um, so it affects every aspect of life. Every aspect of life, whether it's living in rubble or living under siege, the combination makes life hell, frankly. Um, it's a, Israel targeted water and wastewater infrastructure. Was, there was a very clear pattern of that, and there was a report that released. All in all, 20% of the Gaza Strip was flattened. In the neighborhood of Shijaiya, which you just saw, there was, there was resistance there from Palestinian fighters. And uh, Israeli, Israel conducted a ground invasion and uh, went from home to home. Um, inside one of these homes, I found this. This is the Hebrew name, Sukitan with a pitchfork, clearly intended to terrorize the survivors when they return to their homes. I found a lot of vandalism like this. Um, so this is a mosque in Gaza City that was destroyed, and a young man just taking photos of his mosque. Um, I should have mentioned. I should have spoken about this before. But basically, I'm going to describe the buildup to how this how this whole attack happened. Um, so, almost a year ago, there was a unity deal between the two main Palestinian political parties, Hamas and Fatah. Um, and as problematic as the unity deal was. Not that it was really based on real unity, it was more political calculations between the groups. Israel regards any kind of Palestinian unity as a threat. And so um, Benjamin Netanyahu's government decided we are going to uh, attack Hamas in order to force um, Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, essentially, which is a uh, has, has um, a lot of Fatah members in it to, uh, to work with Israel. And I've actually photographed uh, Palestinian security forces of the Palestinian Authority working with uh, Israeli soldiers in order to repress any form of Palestinian resistance. And so it's collaboration. Um, so what happened was um, three teenagers went missing, which we all heard about. Some of us probably know their names. Um, these teens were in the West Bank, and uh, they got in, They were hitchhiking late at night, got into a Palestinian vehicle, um, and uh, they immediately called the police. And then on the police recording, you can hear that these three, three boys, these three teenagers, were immediately shot dead. The vehicle was found by the Israeli police the following day, bloodied and burnt out. 
a gag order. The Israeli government instituted a gag order to prevent Israeli media from uh, letting this information that these three teenagers had been killed to the public. So basically preventing this information from getting to the Israeli public or abroad. And at the same time, Israel launched the Bring Back Our Boys campaign, which was a massive propaganda campaign that was international. The Israeli consulate actually emailed synagogues around the U.S. to have Bring Back Our Boys uh, protests. So where I'm from in Phoenix, I was there at the time, and there were I was in touch with rabbis from around the, the city, and they were having these protests, and I informed one that it was a fraud, and he didn't seem to care. Um, he was being manipulated. Um, at this, so shortly after the boys' bodies were found uh, in a shallow grave not far from where they had been taken, and uh, in this time, Israel uh, used it as a pretext to attack Hamas throughout the West Bank and attack Palestinians, killed, I think, 14 people, rounded up um, hundreds of prisoners who had been released in the previous uh, deal with Gilad Shalit in 2009, 2010, 11, whichever year. Um, and, uh, and so, basically, in response to this, we saw rockets start to come from Gaza. Um, and at the same time, this is when Mohammed Abu Khair was kidnapped, basically, and, and murdered, forced to drink gasoline and set alight because of the incitement of Benjamin Netanyahu, who at the funeral for, for those three teenagers demanded revenge. And so the murder of Mohammed was the unofficial revenge, and the official revenge was getting started on Gaza. Um, this is more graffiti, more vandalism I found in a home in Shijaiya, where Jewish symbols are used as symbols of oppression and violence, encouraging anti-Semitism, inciting anti-Semitism. Um, I'm going to kind of just, I'm not going to be able to describe the entirety of the 51 days. I'll talk about some of the things I found were more shocking. This is Dima and Kamal Kadan who live in the southern Gaza Strip city of Rafah. And these are weapons, Israeli weapons, they found in their home when Israel launched the Hannibal Directive, which is a military order designed to wipe out an entire area when a soldier, when Israeli soldier, is captured. And it's all about avoiding the, the painful political uh, fallout for, for whatever leader has to uh, be in um, the ensuing uh, prisoner exchange. And so this was crafted simply to avoid political fallout. And when the, the, the uh, Hannibal Directive was invoked, in a short time, Israel un uh, unleashed a massive amount of firepower on Rafah and killed 190 civilians, at least, in order to kill one of its own soldiers. And these kids, this family survived, but they described fleeing. They saw bodies dropping like flies around them. Um, this is also in Rafa. I mean, one of, the, one of the ideas of understanding the Gaza Strip and the West Bank is it's a laboratory for Israeli weapons and tactics that are exported around the world, including to this country. A lot of our law enforcement agencies go to Israel to train and so the tactics that we see, that we saw, you know, you see here in the East Bay, the militarization of the police and law enforcement agencies that we see in Ferguson, a lot of these are tested on Palestinians and implement, implemented on people of color in this country. Um, and so this is actually uh, an MK, a Mark 82 dumb bomb that I found in a civilian area in Rafa. And part of it is manufactured in Tucson, Arizona, where I went to university. Um, it's made by Raytheon, which is Tucson's second largest employer. This is um, a Viper mine clearing device. It looks like a barrel bomb, so a lot of Palestinians in Gaza are under the idea that, they were, that Israel dropped barrel bombs on them. 
but it's actually a mine clearing device. And what it does is it's dragged out on a trailer, launched hundreds of feet into the air, and the entire time it's emitting C4 explosives. And when it hits the ground, everything blows up in order to create a path for, for like a tank to come through. This is used in a place, uh, this is used in a, in a densely populated civilian area. We found several of these around Gaza in the laboratory. I found this in uh, this Israeli light anti-tank weapon made by a Norwegian company called Namo. I found this in a women and girls school in Hosea, a village that was partially destroyed, in the principal's office. So while Israel claims that Palestinians were using schools to launch attacks, I found evidence of just the opposite using anti-tank weapons on a place where there are no tanks. This particular weapon was actually made in Mesa, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix, very close to where I grew up. The Norwegian company has a contract, has a subsidiary in Phoenix. Um, I met the family of Salem Shamali, who many of you might know his story. He was a young man who was looking for his family in the rubble of Shajaiya when a sniper opened fire and killed him in three shots on camera. On, and it was filmed by, by uh, a, a man who had, by several international solidarity movement activists who had gone out with him to escort him. Um, Salem's family, when actually when, when we got this footage, and uh, it was released, no one knew who he was. He was known as the man in the green shirt for days, who had just died, been shot to death by a sniper. And his family was sent an email of this news report, and that's how they found out Salem's fate. They recognized his voice and then saw him shot to death. This is his family, who I interviewed a few weeks after their son was murdered. His family all is on antidepressants. His brother has had repeated episodes where he's collapsed and had to go back, go to the hospital to be revived. His younger brother, Wasim, who's 14 years old, told me as he cried that he wanted to join the resistance. Because what choice does he have? I found this map in a home in Shijaiya, which basically laid out how exactly the neighborhood would be occupied and parts of it destroyed. This is an Israeli military map. Um, it wasn't until a couple months later when I ran into a uh, former Israeli combat soldier, Iran Efrati, who told me what this word means, Hardufim, which typically refers to dead soldiers, but in this context, this is a line planned that anyone who crossed it would be shot. And this is what happened to Salem Shamali. He crossed the imaginary line that he didn't know about and was shot to death for it. And this is clear evidence of a war crime targeting civilians. Um, the Iran Afrati spoke to um, combat, spoke to soldiers who were in the house where he was shot from, where Salem Shamali was shot from. And they told him that there was a top-down order that they were allowed to take revenge for the deaths of fellow soldiers. Right before I went into the Gaza Strip, I went to, during the ground invasion, I went to a prayer vigil at the Western Wall um, in Jerusalem. And I expected this prayer vigil, it was a prayer vigil for the well-being of Israeli soldiers. And so I expected it to be a rather somber mood. It was anything but. So I'm going to play just part of uh, this footage that I took. Um, there we go. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but... There's some swearing. Ahim Yabali, 
נותרו בספרים הקדושים, שבזמן אחר, אף על פי שהמצב הרוחני לא היה כפי שצריך, אבל היה אחדות, עם ישראל ניצחו. society in young people the, the kind of post post second intifada generation that's gaining power and so this is where this is where Israel is headed this is where it is the violence that these kids called for was really I saw it played out in Gaza that's exactly what I saw what we saw from the IDF spokesperson didn't really match up the rhetoric did not match the reality. This, however, did. Um, it wasn't until the ceasefire was imminent, the terms were agreed upon, that Israel launched, uh, unleashed its massive, its, its biggest amount of violence, its largest attacks, which was not reported for whatever reason. But this night, I was in Gaza, when uh, three, two 13, 14-story towers were leveled um, that have absolutely no military value. There were pure civilian, there were civilian infrastructure that were taken out. And I filmed the, just the bombing of one of them, which I'll show you here. This is the Italian compound, which was uh, basically a, a middle kind of professional class was was home to doctors and engineers and these kinds of people that actually that are not sympathetic to the political goals of Hamas. So while it's called a war on Hamas, it's clearly not the case. Right here you can see, if you watch right here, you can see a flashing light. That's the building that's going to be taken out. And the first bomb you will see hit what Israel calls knock on the roof. It's a drone strike, a smaller bomb to warn of a bigger bomb. So you can see the shrapnel flying high in the air, which hit a hospital nearby. The residents who had fled were given a short, short notice. Um, the Israeli military sometimes will call ahead to say, we're going to bomb this building. And if you get a call, you're responsible for disseminating that throughout the entire building. So I met young people who were helping, helping elderly people escape minutes before these buildings were destroyed. Yet if you watch media here, that'll be portrayed as humane. The most moral army. 
There's the last airstrike they hit the Italian compound with. And as the sun came up and the bombing stopped, I went to the, to the Italian compound. This is what you just saw destroyed, as well as Albasha Tower, which was completely flattened, turned to rubble. And if you watch media in this country, you might think this man was responsible for that destruction. But he was a victim. This is Albasha Tower. This was a, one of the bigger towers in, uh, in, in Gaza City that housed uh, media, a lot of media production agencies. Um, and so that was a direct attack on, on journalists, on Gaza's ability to communicate to the outside world. It was a very serious question. Two nights before, the Zafar Tower, the Zafar Four Tower was hit, and I came back, and uh, I was staying with friends who live right across the street, whose building was also under threat. That's one thing the Israelis will say, "We're going to bomb your building," and then they don't do it, and they say, "We're going to bomb your building," and they don't do it, and so they lose their credibility. And that's one of the things that happened in Shijaia, where people were told to flee. They did. They came back. They did, and then they didn't know, so they were told to flee again. And some didn't, and they were bombed. It's a, it's a form of psychological torture, warfare. Um, I guess this isn't really legible, but this was a sign to the world. It, said, is this, it says, it's not in great English, but is this the Israeli's 21st century civilization? More than 150 children became homeless. What were you, ex what were you expecting? What kind of feelings would this brutality and criminality engender? That was the message to the world that the residents of Zafar IV wanted to send. Back at the Basha Tower, oops, um, I met, I, I went right after the destruction, and people were too shell-shocked to speak. So I went and slept for a couple hours after staying up all night, and I came back, and I met Salim al Qasas, who told me that when, um, the attack was when he, when the attack was about to happen. They ran and hid behind a building down the street. And a few minutes later, he didn't even tell me this at first, but he asked if I wanted to see his home that had been hit. And so he brought me to the top floor of his home, where two weeks before, two he uh, two drone strikes hit the top of his building, where his family, where uh, nine women and girls were killed while they were preparing iftar dinner. And he ran upstairs and found their bodies in pieces. And here he counts the dead. After the ceasefire, there was $5.4 billion pledged to go to Gaza by the international community in Cairo which was a great irony considering that Cairo is where the Sisi regime is in power, which collaborates with, with Israel to keep the siege on Gaza. And so this money has actually not made it to Gaza. The 5.4 billion, half of it went to the Palestinian Authority for salaries. And most of the, the money otherwise, uh, the, the construction material is sitting in storage and not allowed into Gaza. And so basically, Palestinians took it upon themselves to do DIY rebuilding in any way they can. They salvaged, this is the Zafar Four Tower, the rubble, where they would just take any amount of rebar that they could, strip it clean of any concrete, and use a manual press in order to straighten it. And this is going on all over the Gaza Strip. You can see there are teams of them here. Um, all of these guys on this crew lost their homes. They were all destroyed in, the, in Beit Hanun, in the north. 
And this is the only way they could survive. This is in Beit Hanun. And if, uh, if your home wasn't completely destroyed, it's half destroyed, which is, presents another challenge, because in order to get that rebar to have a chance at rebuilding, you have to destroy it by hand. You have to destroy the rest of your home by hand. So here's just a quick clip of basically how people are forced to demolish the rest of their home. I mean, all I can think of, this really shows the, the, the balance of power, where Palestinians have been reduced to rubble people, have been, it's like ants, uh, you know, whose, whose hill was kicked over by an angry child, and then they do their best to rebuild their hill. That's the balance of power. Uh, some farmers in the in area of uh, Beit Safiya were, um, took, took wooden pallets to construct some kind of temporary shelter. And this was about the best you could hope for. So people are really taking it upon themselves to make the situation better, rather than embrace the, vic the, the mentality of a victim. That's what's going on inside. Another farmer built this to live in after his home was destroyed. Um, my most recent trip to Gaza in early January was during a brutal winter storm in which five infants froze to death. And so this is when it's not war. And these, this family, whose home was blown up, the only, they tried to use a netting from an Israeli tank that they found as shelter, which of course was very inadequate. And so millions of Palestinians sit, burning what they can in order to stay warm. Um, okay, close. I'm going to show, I'm working on a, uh, my colleague Max Blumenthal and I are, are working on a documentary, so I'm going to show that I've just finished the trailer pretty recently, and uh, I'm going to show it. So that'll be the conclusion. Um.
Okay, this is in uh, the hair? Uh, yes, the hair. Uh, yes, the hair. Yes, the hair. Yes, the hair. And this one is in the hair. Yes, 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 the hair. That is a documentary that I'm working on. Hopefully, we're going to release the trailer soon, and we're hoping to have it uh, finished by um, the anniversary of the attack this summer. Um, but that concludes my presentation, um, and I think we can open it up to Q&A. Gaza, you have to register with the um, Israeli government press office. So you have to get a, you have to basically get um, like a letter from a bigger agency in order to get in. So um, it's if you can do that, it's pretty easy. It's pretty seamless. Um, which is you know in stark contrast to like it's it's a pretty heavy feeling to know that you can I can come and go. I have a card in my pocket that allows me to come and go through the God, in, in and out of the Gaza Strip when my friends I leave and I have no idea if I'll ever see them again and they are just at the whim of somebody who can press a button and kill them. How long were you in Lida? Uh, I think two and a half months or yeah, about, about three months. Did you work with Abed? Sorry? Did you work with Abed? Uh, Abed. Abed Fattah Absurd. Ah, I know his, I know his son, Mohammed. Okay. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah. He runs the, he runs the children's center and, uh, there, and the children's dance on the theater center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been there. Nice. Yeah. A bunch of us sort of did the human show and stuff. I think I remember reading that uh, Max Blumenthal and a colleague, probably you, probably. visited the Reichstag le last summer. Oh no, that was David Sheen, who was oh, at the at the Bundestag uh, right. in uh, yeah. yeah in Germany. I was going to ask about that. But, but yeah, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're banned though. Uh, from to follow up on the other question, there, yeah. like if, if you do gain as a journalist uh, uh, entry uh, entrance to Gaza and it's stamped on your passport, then when you go back into uh, Israel proper, are you <coughs> given a hard time by border patrol people? Or? Just because I have the press card and I have a work visa, I'm not, um, I can pretty much come and go. But once that expires, and also, I mean, even before that, before when I was on tourist visas, because I'm a white American Jew, I pretty much seamlessly passed through the borders. But, you know, if you're, 
identified. I mean, I always wonder what's going to happen if my work visa runs out and I'm kind of, you know, the more notoriety I get, at one point will I be banned? I don't know. It's possible. Yeah. Just following up, is Mondo Weiss the agency that got you the press card? No. It's not. <laughs> they don't, uh, well, they used to give uh, Mondo Weiss press cards, they don't anymore. We're trying to get yeah. that reinstated. So you had something more mainstream? Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh, did you did you learn Arabic? Or? No, my Arabic is it's still terrible. I uh, I'm I'm gonna take lessons when I get back, but it's pretty it's pretty bad. Translators. Yeah, I mean I rely on translators and friends basically. Um, the guy who you heard at the end of the video, this is my like one of my closest friends, Jihad Saktawi, who lives in Gaza, and I would just go out. I stayed with him, and I would go out with him and work for the day, and. Uh, he would pretty much translate in broken English what was going on. And then I would get better translation from the videos I have. How are you, how are you Max, funding yourself? Um, I mean, through I write articles and through my work, basically. And also, you know, doing these talks helps. Um, but yeah, it's not a, I don't make a great living, but it's enough. Yeah. Yes. Do you get any uh, negative reactions from, from people here to your work? Um, like from at, at the talks? Or like yeah, in the or US? just in general, like people in the US. I mean, generally people are pretty receptive, but I mean, I've had a couple of, uh, of hecklers, basically. But I mean, you know, it's pretty hard to, I, I don't know what you could argue about what I presented. Maybe you could argue with some of my analysis, but you know, finding maps, my map that shows that uh, it was allowed, they were, you know, soldiers were allowed from a top-down plan to take to shoot civilians. There's not much you can say to that. There was an article written about me in Phoenix, um, in the Phoenix Jewish News, that basically smeared me and distorted my presentation. And the guy who wrote it didn't come talk to me. And uh, I'm in talks with the editor to try to get it uh, to try to get a counterpiece, but we'll see if the Jewish News of Arizona is actually wants to represent the diversity in Jewish opinion on Israel, or if it's you know purely Zionist. What's the context around you wanting to report on Palestine? Were you raised in a pro-Palestinian or a Zionist? Yeah, I was raised. I mean, you know. I think being an American Jew, you kind of become Zionist by default because, especially how I was raised Reform, like mostly secular, and so my, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up very religious, but like the religion was kind of hollowed out and filled with Zionism, and so I was really raised to support Israel. I went, I went to Israel when I was 13. I had my bar mitzvah in East Jerusalem at the Wall, you know, um, so like I was, it was very much like. I was supposed to support Israel, and then when I was in college, I just I took a history class, and I would just sit and read the text, and it all just started to like fall apart, and I became more and more angry. Basically, I felt like I was lied to, and so that's uh, part of what fuels me. But it's not even really a Jewish thing necessarily; it's just a human thing. I mean, that's what it comes down to. So what exactly were you reading? Like, would you give any suggestions for anyone who asks us? The other person, like, what kind of books? What authors? What? I mean, to get a uh, like a grasp. I mean, it's important to study history to get like a good historical foundation to understand like even what is Zionism. A lot of American Jews I grew up with can't even tell you what Zionism is. Um, so just to understand basics, I mean. Uh, David Hurst wrote uh, The Gun in the Olive Branch, which is like an excellent, you know, it's a great book for understanding this. Um, in, Iron Wall, Bobby Schleyer. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's, you know, I mean, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Ilan Pape. Like, there's a lot of literature that really lays out um, what exactly happened that's, you know, available. But, um, yeah, it's out there. Uh, I think she might have first. Go ahead. Yeah. 
what is your take on BDS campaign and how it affects you? Do you think it is on the ground and outside? I mean, it's hard for me to say how effective it is. Um, I think it's I think it's important. It's a tactic, you know. It's when when people demand that you know Palestinians take up a nonviolent tactic, BDS is it. And, and Palestinian civil society called for BDS, and that's for us on the outside to respond to. Um, and there's no, it's not like there's a political movement in Israeli society that we can support from the outside to end the occupation, to actually have equality, to end supremacy. Um, and so BDS is a tactic. It's an important tactic, and it's one that every single one of us can participate in, and that's why it's important, but I can't, I mean, I don't really know, it's hard to, to estimate its impact. I will say, it does make uh, Zionists go crazy. <laughs> so, there's something to be said for that. Uh, yeah. um, have you been contacted uh, so that your documentation is used in a, a human rights case? Um, a little bit, not a whole lot. There's a... Uh, a colleague of mine who I, wor who I was working with in Gaza basically got contracted by Amnesty International to, to do work because Israel wouldn't allow Human Rights Watch or Amnes in, 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 Amnesty International into Gaza, which is pretty telling. Yeah. Um, aside from yourself and Max, um, how many other Western journalists would you say were actually in Gaza trying to cover what was actually happening? I mean, Max and I weren't there through the heaviest parts of the assault. Um, we were there towards the latter half, and Max actually left when the ceasefire, we went in during a ceasefire, a five day ceasefire, with the idea that we would leave if bombing resumed, and he left and I decided to stay. Um, and, but at that point it was not nearly as, I mean I was basically seeing people return to their homes from shelters and seeing the aftermath. Um, but I mean colleagues of mine, there were, there were a number of them uh, you know, who who were there documenting the everyday brutality, the really shocking horrors of what was going on. Um, so, you know, all my respect to them. But I mean, honestly, the Palestinian journalists did the, do the best work because they're the ones who it's like most real for. Um, that's the truth of the matter. Is there any notable resistance to this in Israel, Jewish? There are, I mean, it's a tiny, tiny fragment of society that's very marginalized um, of, like, anti-Zionists. Um, but <coughs> Israel's just moved further and further right. And it's, a, you know, when it's a society, a country that's based, that's founded on violence and supremacy, that's expected. And so there's no, there's not like a real movement that we can put our weight, our, our weight, our support behind. Um, I mean, there are, they do exist, but they're like a few hundred people out of several million. So. Doesn't show up in graffiti. I mean, it shows up here and there, but by and large, I mean, there was a, there were anti-war rallies I went to last summer, but they were more against the war, for the sake of being against the war, not. Uh, is a symptom, not to, you know, most of the protesters were liberal Zionists that would not really question the idea of Jewish supremacy in Palestine, but rather, we don't want war. So, it's, it's a bit hollow. Um, but I mean, there are organizations, there are, you know, there are people who refuse, there, it exists, but it's very marginal, unfortunately. Um, so, during during this uh, summer in Gaza, the uh, armed resistance, compared to cast lead, put up a fairly strong fight, killed, I don't know, something like 60 yeah. invading Israeli soldiers. Um, and I got the impression that within Gazan society, armed resistance has become maybe a slightly more um, respected central political strategy um, than it's been in a while. What's your impression since? since the summer of the way that the relative success of 
of armed resistance has politically launched itself in Gaza society? I mean, yeah, you're right. The, uh, the resistance killed 66 soldiers, and that's and when the Israeli soldiers were allowed to take revenge on civilians, that was the revenge was for killing because the resistance killed Israeli <laughs> soldiers. Um, and by and large, people do support armed resistance because they see it as their only line of defense. I mean, during the attack, everyone supports. You know, leftists support. Hamas, because they're the ones resisting. Um, you know, the secular nationalists are in Ramallah working with the Israelis to, to repress. So it's like a lot of my friends hate living under Hamas. It's, it's an authoritarian regime, without a doubt. But Hamas is the only, I mean, as well as like Islamic Jihad, but, you know, these few organizations, these... Um, uh, Islamist uh, parties that are defending. So it's like, yes, people, some people hate them, but they hate Israel that much more. They hate, you know, and that's that's the reality of it. Well, the PFLP also. Yeah. Like, space and on, space yeah, and yeah. I mean, and there were, like, actually, I went to, um, right after the ceasefire, I went to a rally in uh, Shijaiya, in the, the bombed out ruins of Shijaiya where Abu Obaida, who's the spokesperson for Al-Qassam, Hamas's uh, armed wing, um, spoke. And he speaks about unity. And you had, all of, you had figures from all of the resistance groups all together speaking about unity and how that's the most important thing. Um, but Qassam keeps a, maintains some distance from the Hamas political leadership. Um, so people, yeah, they, su they support armed resistance, but not necessarily the political goals of Hamas. Um, do journalists have a particular procedure, you know, they must know that they're at great risk for what will happen to their documentation, say, in an event where they get injured or killed? I don't think so. Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, that's just that's part of the risk. I mean, I, yeah, unfortunately. How is the life there for female journalists? Like, do we need female activists to come here to work or to volunteer? Like in in Gaza? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are female. Like, one of my uh, a good friend of mine, Iba Rezek. She, I mean, she was my fixer for a while. Um, so she can, you know, she can do whatever she wants, um, essentially. I mean, she's not gonna like walk around in a mini skirt, but um, it's not like she's oppressed because, you know, she's female. And there are female journalists who do excellent work, absolutely. Um, when, when you talk about the Israeli population moving to the right, how big, how big a factor is the uh, influx of Russians is that, is that have a lot to do with the political climate? And the I mean, Russians in Israel tend to support um, uh, Yisrael Batenyu, Lieberman's party. Abigdor Lieberman, the, the foreign minister who's former bouncer and thug who beat up a kid. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I mean, they tend to be right wing. But, um, so is there not more so than Yeah, I mean, everyone is right-wing. <laughs> okay, so Russians are not more right-wing, is what I'm asking. Not that I'm aware of, but that's not something I can really speak with a lot of authority on. How long were you there after the, the final ceasefire? Um, I only stayed for about three days after that, and then I came back some weeks later for about a month, and then... Um, and then, and then I came back again for like a week. So I've spent a total of like almost three months there. One of the reasons Israel was so brutal um, was to try and alienate the population, Palestinian population from Hamas, to uh, right. take them away from Hamas from supporting them. Did you get a sense for that? Or did you get a sense that the opposite was actually happening? In terms of like, was it actually effective? Yeah, as in, yeah, were they, did the support increase, did the support dwindle, what, what happened? I mean, it's, 
the thing is, there's no really, there's not like another option than Hamas. You know, there's not like another party, another big party that's going to come up and and uh, and offer some kind of alternative. Did so you see dissent? Was there dissent that you were that was? Not really. Weird? I mean, there were there were. Uh, yeah, no, I I didn't really see a lot of dissent. I mean, people. The main thing is people are trying to survive. You know, and that's kind of. I mean, it's like. Israelis, there was there was like a propaganda campaign where the Israeli government said that uh, Hamas was like, there were people trying to protest and Hamas was like arresting them and attacking them. And it's like people are literally just trying to stay in their home and survive. And it's not safe in their home. It's just completely bogus. So it's not really a time when you would see a lot of political activity in that sense. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for all your work. Um, uh, I wanted to know how we could um, help, like because you said the money didn't go to them. Or? Right. I mean, there are organizations you can donate to. I don't know a whole lot about, to be honest. Um, there's one. I mean, one thing I'm going to be working on soon. There was a little boy I met who had uh, this disease called PKU, which is like a my understanding is it's a genetic disorder that uh, if you don't have like the special kind of milk, then you're like developmentally disabled. And I met this little boy who is just scooting around on his butt because he doesn't, his legs don't work. And so I'm going to be fundraising soon to get this money to buy this milk, which is available. You can get the milk, you just have to have the money to buy it. Um, so there's that. So like I'll, I'll definitely tweet that out. I'm going to probably do a video when I get back to Gaza about it. Um, but there are, yeah, I, I mean, otherwise, I don't know a whole lot of options, to be honest. I know they exist, but this is not my area of expertise. Okay. Okay. I'm doing fundraising for the wheelchair, too. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. So she might be able to talk to more about that. Yeah. Um, so the videos that we uh, weren't able to finish on earlier, uh, is there... You, are those online on YouTube or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, they're all on my YouTube channel, or you can just like search on Mondo Weiss. Um, yeah, but they're all they're all available. You uh, talk a little bit, sort of comparing how you're treated as you know a Jewish journalist in like Gaza, the West Bank, compared to how you're treated sort of in uh, Israel proper. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, when I lived in Ida camp, I was nicknamed the Refugee. <laughs> so, it's not really a nickname I embraced, or like I called myself that, but I mean, I was called that by like a lot of the refugees in Ida. Um, and, you know, there's not the foundational racism that you see in Israeli society that, you know, you saw in that video, where it's completely normal to just shout you know, kill Arabs. And it gets worse, actually. If you watch the rest of the video, it gets worse. Um, it just doesn't exist in Palestinian society. Um, Palestinian, it's a normal society. It's an indige indigenous culture. Israel is a settler colonial state. It brought up the white supremacy from Europe. And that's on full display. Even within Israeli society, there is a massive amount of racism. It's supposed to be a white Jewish state, a European bastion in the Middle East, you know, against the hordes of the, you know, evil Arabs. Um, but um, in Israeli society, I mean, I've gone to demonstrations, like right-wing demonstrations, where I've been threatened repeatedly to break my camera. I've been spit on right uh, in front of a police officer. I was spit on and threatened, and the cop doesn't care. And one Israeli a uh, protester told me, the cops don't mind if you beat up a leftist. How do we know in a situation like that? Can't you pretend this is from like NBC or something? Oh, they don't care. I mean, they literally I mean, how just they don't know care. That, you're sort of that I'm a journalist? Well, that you're critical of Zionism. And they don't. Israel. They don't. They have no idea. And I usually kind of try to blend in just, you know, I'm not out there like chanting like in the occupation at least. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, no, it doesn't matter. They just, if you have a camera, you know, if you're a journalist, they don't like you. Oh. In ge generally speaking, it's unlike the street level. I mean, you can interview some of the, like, higher-ups in some of the racist organizations, 
but in general, they're skeptical. If you're trying to get information out, instead of joining them, you know, why? Max has a scurrilous video, I think it was in Tel Aviv, right? Which is college kids, a lot of American Jews and such. Oh, uh, it's in Jerusalem, yeah. It's in Jerusalem. Uh -huh. I mean, I don't know how he does it. He just sits there, he's like the, like a talk show host, lets these people talk. And I mean, he's got a special talent for it, but in some ways, <laughs> it's pretty, you know, you like as an American Jew, you know, I watched Max's videos before I went over it, and I was like, wait a minute, I can do this? You just... I'm a white American Jew. Like they tell me, I, actually, I was in a taxi, and uh, the taxi driver starts asking me, you know, how long have you been here? All this stuff, and I told him, oh, I've been here for like several months. This is in Tel Aviv, in the liberal bubble, the liberal city. And uh, he said, oh, so you were here during the war with the rockets? And I was like, yeah, actually, I was in Gaza. <laughs> <laughs> His attitude flipped really quickly, and uh, he told me that if his, because I like Arabs, that if his son were there, his son would kill me. <laughs> so this is how like normalized the violence and racism is. Um, where, you know, if you're an, a white American Jew and you go there unaware of these things, you will notice it. But it's like as soon as you peel back that layer, it's all there for you to see. Do you have any knowledge of where this uh, normalization and like prejudice and bias come from? Would it, comes from? Would you say it's like education? Or, I'm you, sorry, I don't know. Would you know where this stems from? Like all of this right wing like education, like, like what have you seen? This? Like why is the right wing so strong? Yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot of it has to do with the education system, but it's all aspects of society. I mean, Israeli society is designed to make you know, good soldiers, not good citizens. The military is the top of society. If you don't join the military, um, your your chances of being successful, you know, having a career af uh, afterwards are, are slim, um, especially if you're not Ashkenazi, if you're not a white Jew. Um, and that's the racism within Israeli society. So, Um, I'm confused. How are all of these like white American Jews going to Israel for birthright, not like peeling back the slavery and seeing everything, or are they just ignoring it? No. Okay. So I went on birthright. I was like as critical as you could be while still going on birthright, and uh, that was actually the first time I stayed afterwards. And I went to the West Bank and I saw, you know, occupation for the first time, and it was really shocking for me. And that's part of what like led me to do the work I'm doing now. But um. When I was on Birthright, you know, I, I spoke to American settlers from Baltimore. We were told on, on Friday night to go ask Israelis in Jerusalem what Shabbat means to them. And I went around, <laughs> and I met these American settlers, and uh, I asked them what they thought Israel should do about Gilad Shalit, who was the Israeli soldier who was captured uh, at the time. Um, and he told me, this, this father told me, the first day that Gilad is not with us, take out one neighborhood in Gaza. The second day, two neighborhoods. The third day, three neighborhoods. And so this was like really shocking violence for me. And so I went back, you know, to our group where you present in, our, in front of everyone what you learned about Shabbat for Israelis. And I told them that, and I got booed. I just got booed by the entire group. And so that was, I mean, so part of it is, as a white person in this country, you are indoctrinated into racism. You know, we are. Um, and so, I mean, it's the same reason a lot of people of color, you know, look at Palestine and Israel and identify more with Palestinians. And white people tend to identify more with Israelis. Um, so there is a system, there's a culture of racism. Any other questions? 